Good evening, good afternoon, and welcome everybody. My name is Lynn O'Hara and I'm the Director of Programs at National History Day. Uh, we're thrilled to have you join us for our historical argumentation webinar series. This is our fourth iteration of the series. And we need to say a huge thank you to the Library of Congress Teaching with Primary Sources Consortium and regional partners for sponsoring the program and having so many teachers in the program. We have 170 teachers from, I think it's 49 different NHD affiliates joining us this fall, in addition to several other hundred who have taken the class over the first three rounds. So I'm the director of programs. I work at National History Day's national office. I'm also joined by my colleague, Elena McNaughton. Elena is going to be staffing our Q&A box tonight. Uh, if you work national contests, you worked with Elena, even if you don't know it. And we're joined tonight by Dr. Christopher Hamner, who's a history professor at George Mason University. We're thrilled to have you, but let's go ahead and start with some basic housekeeping, some things, just kind of nuts and bolts to get us going. So first thing to know, when this webinar starts, right now about 7.01 p.m. Eastern, you're going to get an email. It's going to come from Google Classroom, but it looks like it comes from me, that says your webinar is late. Please don't worry about that. Don't stress about that. We're gonna go in and check everybody off, but we've gotta do that manually, so that will happen tomorrow morning. So don't worry about a late assignment, you won't lose any points. Two things to know. We have a Q&A box that is active. We don't have a live chat box. That's intentional. Both Elena and I use this account when we work with students and we don't have side chats going on. We also, I also find them very, very distracting. That being said, if you have a question at any point, please put it in the question box and we'll either answer it by Elena answering you directly or some that she's gonna save for our Q&A portion at the end. We also have live captioning enabled. That can be helpful for you, particularly if you're in a noisy area or might have a hearing issue. If you prefer not to use the live captioning, simply hit the hide captions button on your control panel, which usually appears at the bottom of your screen. So how do you get credit for this? You get credit by completing the survey that happens at the end. You gotta get through the end to get the survey link. Sorry, we've been teachers before. So we'll give that out at the end. If you miss it, if you forget, don't stress, I'll send it to you in the morning. If you have questions of things like um, having access to the slides, the bibliography, the video link, all of those materials will be shared with everyone on Google Classroom. So if there's something you want to grab or a particular source, or if you want to rewatch a part of the video, it'll all be available. The next deadline is our Historical Thinking Skills Organizer, and that's due on Google Classroom on Friday, September 15th at noon. Now, that I'm gonna give some more details about at the end of the webinar in my section. And we do one module at a time. So as module one closes out on the 15th, module two will launch and we do that intentionally. We do that in part to keep the class paced so we don't have people working in, in all kinds of different modules, but we also use it because just like real teachers everywhere, we monitor and adjust and we tweak things in module two based on things we see in the discussion boards in module one or comments from our discussion leaders or facilitators. So we tweak as we go, but you can expect that that's gonna launch and come to you by Friday the 15th. All right, that's all I've got for the first part. So I'm gonna turn things over to Dr. Hamner to talk a little bit about the historical thinking skills in the first part. And then I'll jump back in in the second part. Um, and Elena and I will both jump back on at the end for Q&A. So Christopher, thank you. Welcome back. We're so happy to have you. Thank you so much, Lynn. I can't tell you how glad I am to be back. Lynn and I have been working together since I think 2014. I've been working with National History Day for almost a decade. Um, and it has been fantastic. Not only have I learned a lot about my own teaching practice, uh, but I've met some of the most amazing teachers and people that I've met anywhere in my career. So I'm super grateful to Lynn International National History Day. I'm grateful to the Library of Congress for making this possible. Um, and I'm grateful to you all out in the audience. I know that it is busy with the start of the school year. I also know that the past um, 
three years have been supremely taxing on people who teach and work in the classroom. We know you've got a lot of bricks in your backpack right now, and I'm really glad that you are spending part of this fall with us to learn a little bit more about um, what we do and, and maybe some ways to do it better. So I wanted to start by just talking a little bit about my own kind of development as a historian. And I went off to graduate school um, very much you know, in love with the idea of teaching history and being a historian um, and having almost no idea it turned out in what that actually meant and what it looked like. I think it's a pretty safe bet that most of you all in the audience love history. Uh, it's been my experience that you don't go into this profession unless you really like the past and like introducing it to other people. And if you're like me, you probably had some special moments, whether they were books or high school teachers or lectures or historical sites, something that captured your attention at an impressionable age uh, that made you want to do this. Um, and for me, it was a, a bunch of great teachers and then a whole library shelf full of great books. And I went off to graduate school thinking, I want to do this. Um, but I didn't have a great idea of what this was. So I knew what the finished product looked like. And when I went to graduate school, I had a pretty good idea of what primary sources were. I had a great AP US history teacher and some, some good instructors in college. So I understood what the raw material was. And I had encountered these amazing books and lectures, um, but I didn't really understand the, the transformative process of how the raw material became the finished product. And that was really frustrating and, and maybe a little bit discouraging for me as a, as a brand new historian just getting started. And part of why I think that was frustrating is that 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 transformative process, that kind of ghostly arrow in between, that all happened off stage. So I read the finished book or I heard the really polished lecture, but I had no idea how that thing came to be because my, my professors and great historians and great authors, they did their work in their offices or in the archives or in the library. So if I had a great instructor, a great book, like I didn't see what, what the author had done to make that happen because she was off screen. That all happened kind of behind closed doors. And as a result, it almost seemed to me like a kind of magic, um, that this was something that you, you were kind of born able to do and it happened you know, away from the prying eyes of the public and you just made some magic transformation happen, almost like alchemy, right? Like turning lead into gold by some process that I wasn't allowed to see. Um, being a consumer of history, which is very much what I was as an undergraduate, was like going to the, the Michelin star restaurant and getting this magnificent meal that's been really carefully prepared. And if you've had a great fine dining experience, you know what that's like, you know, that everything comes out and it's plated perfectly and the entree and the sides, all the flavor notes blend together and everything is arranged in a way to just make the experience transformative for you as the, the visitor. Um, and I knew like what the raw materials, the sort of primary sources, the ingredients looked like as a, as a kind of amateur home cook. But I had no idea how the, the raw stuff turned into this beautiful finished meal. And as it turns out, you know, history like cooking, it's not magic. There's actually a set of steps. If you started watching, you know, any of these reality TV shows about your restaurant life and life in the kitchen, you know that professional chefs actually follow a very, you know, kind of prescribed set of, of steps and they have tools and skills for braising and sauteing and mincing to transform the raw materials into the finished thing. And so what we've kind of conceived this webinar as is a chance for you to, to step into the kitchen and practice with us and with each other your, your basic skills with an idea of learning to do these things a little bit better 
or maybe to just learn to talk about them better so that it's easier for us to lead our students through the process. Everybody here is familiar with primary sources, with locating them, um, and we all understand their kind of foundational relationship to great finished history. What we hope that this series will be is a kind of demystification of the process, how the primary sources turn into the finished product. And we'll give you more ways to describe this process to your students as you become the guide. None of this is original to, to me um, or my experience. I'm just kind of drawing on the things that, that I have seen both as a historic, uh, as a student of history and now as a, as a historian who acts as a mentor. Uh, what we're going to do is look at that process of transformation from primary sources to finished historical argument in a series of four webinars that are designed to demystify the process and give you new ways to talk about it with your students and maybe some new ways to think about it yourselves. So tonight we're going to think about historical thinking skills and the analysis of primary sources. We'll come back next month and talk about historical interpretation, which is really the process of fitting individual sources together. The month after that, we'll talk a little bit more about argumentation and evidence in our webinar, and we'll talk about ways to use sources uh, to create insights and insights to create an argument that is persuasive to a reader. And then in our final webinar, we'll come back to organizing an argument, and we'll talk about arranging ideas drafting an outline and writing off an outline to make a persuasive argument for readers. That last webinar will have tons of nuts and bolts advice about writing uh, that you might use in your own writing and you might use in talking to your students about writing. So lots of insights, lots of things that we've developed over time through just a long process of trial and error. And again, what Lynn and I uh, hope to share with you is a kind of demystification of the process and a way to systematize thinking about primary sources, historical analysis, and historical argumentation that is straightforward and repeatable so that you can do this on your own, your own lesson prep, and do it with your students. So that's the game plan. Tonight, we're going to dive into historical thinking skills, and we'll break them down into a, a suite of four different tools that belong in the toolkit, sourcing, close reading, corroboration, and contextualization. This is probably very familiar to a lot of you in the audience, and I think as we go through the historical thinking skills, whether or not those names are familiar to you, the concepts behind them are going to be familiar to, to just about uh, all of you who have a couple of years of teaching under your belt. None of them are new to me. Uh, these all come from a great book by Sam Weinberg called Historical Thinking and Other Unnatural Acts. And I always tell my students not to overlook the subtitle, both because I think it's kind of a funny aside, but it hides a real important kernel of truth that thinking historically about primary sources is often very counterintuitive. The natural ways that we encounter information in the wild are, are not the ways that historians think about sources and try to make sense of them. And so for a lot of my students, the early part of becoming a historian involves kind of learning a new way of thinking about things that doesn't feel intuitive at first. And so a lot of what we try to do is you know, kind of build some new habits over their old intuitive ways of doing things. There are four historical thinking skills. And I tell my students, it's a lot like baseball. You know, there's a, just a few skills in baseball. You hit, you feel, you run the bases. You can learn the game of baseball in an hour, and then you can spend the rest of you know, your life kind of practicing the skills, getting better at them. And so it's one of those things you can, you can learn in a short period of time, and then you can explore until your heart's content. I am still working on my historical thinking skills and still developing parts of my toolkit quarter of a century into my career. 
I also remind my students that the historical thinking skills are really similar no matter what level they're practiced at. So, you know, Little League Baseball, Major League Baseball, the, the proficiency of the participants is obviously different, but the nature of the game, the rules of the game, and, and what the players are trying to do stays the same. And it's been my experience that that's true of history as well. So I have a, a number of PhD students who are in the last phases of their dissertations, and I have a 13-year-old nephew who just started eighth grade and has become kind of a history buff. And I spend time talking about historical thinking with both of these groups. Uh, and I will say that the way we, we think about a uh, source that we're exploring is very similar whether I'm working with my 13-year-old nephew or a PhD student. Now, the sophistication is a little bit different, and I'm hoping that my graduate students have some, some insights that would probably escape my, my middle school age nephew. But the basics of the skills remain the same. And so this is a, a great toolkit to practice and to give to your students, and one that uh, you can keep developing for the rest of your life. There is really no substitute for developing historical thinking skills than to just practice them. And to that end, we have created two groups of primary sources that we refer to as sandboxes, because they're a place for you to just roll up your sleeves and, and play and experiment a little. Uh, there are two groups. The one on the left represents a group of documents related to the 1854 Kansas-Nebraska Act. The one on the right, it represents a group of documents related to the 1889 Johnstown flood in Pennsylvania. They're sandboxes. They're just places to play. It doesn't matter whether you know either of these events is something that you personally teach in your curriculum. In fact, in some ways, I think it helps a little bit if these are unfamiliar events. I knew a uh, a decent amount about the Kansas-Nebraska Act since I spent some time teaching about the Civil War in my undergraduate classes. I will acknowledge I had never even heard of the Johnstown flood until this summer. Lynn used to teach in Pennsylvania, so she's familiar with it. But I had never heard about it until one of my graduate students on a break from class in the summer just mentioned this event and it sounded interesting. And like a lot of you probably, I did a little research and then I fell down a rabbit hole. And then five hours later, I realized there was a whole fascinating event here I had never heard about in the past. And so it, it sort of helps to practice on things you don't have a lot of prior knowledge about. And the sandboxes are gonna give you a place to practice these skills. And those will be a big part of the assignments that you'll do uh, as part of the webinar series. So we've given you some, some sources to start playing with and we we look forward to you just kind of experimenting with them. Tonight, the, the subject of the experimentation is going to be the suite of historical thinking skills. And this is not a sort of recipe or a step one, step two, step three, step four. It's a, it's a toolkit that historians will apply to sources, and it's iterative. So I might start in one place um, and then I might jump to corroboration, and that might lead me to do some close reading, which might drive me down to contextualization, which might lead me back to sourcing. It's not a sort of one, two, three, four, and then you're done. But for historians, making sense of a primary source often feels to me like you're you're picking a lock. You know, you've got those little tools that that you see burglars use, and they're kind of you know jimmying something around and jiggling and hoping that they'll get the tumblers to fall into place and the lock will open up and for us the lock opening up is some new insight about the source um, and so we'll we'll discuss today and in our next webinar a little bit about how you can navigate your way through these tools um, for me i usually start with sourcing um, if i don't have any other place to go because that's one of the most straightforward set of questions about the source. And the historical thinking of skill of sourcing just reminds us to, to pause before we dive in and to ask ourselves some basic questions about who made this source, when did they make it, uh, who did they make it for, and how did it go out into the world, and what kind of message or argument did it carry? Uh, it's This is one of the counterintuitive things, because people who are not historians often just jump right into interpretation and they they don't pause, tap the brakes and ask just a series of questions about 
well, when did when did this get made and who did it get made for and, and who was it made by? And those things are really important. So a good part of my life um, in the classroom, the beginning of any semester is to remind my students every time I put something new on the board that they have to pause before they start interpreting and just ask these questions. Uh, and the reason sourcing is important is because those details about the source, who made it and when they made it and who they made it for, are often really important in understanding what the source looks like and what it means. So a source that I use a lot in my early semester teaching is this one. And one of the reasons that I use it is my students are so familiar with it. So the minute this image goes up on the board, my students are already you know, shifting in their seats and hands go up because they know what this is. It's the Boston Massacre uh, in the War of Independence, you know, kind of an early episode in the escalating tensions between the colonists and the redcoats. And this is so familiar to them from their high school history classes that they just want to roar straight ahead. And I have to remind them to tap the brakes a little. Like, what, what do we know about this source's, uh, you know, originator? Who, who made it and when did they make it? And then we have to slow down a little bit. And some of that information is visible here. So we've got a date. Um, on the source, and you can actually see uh, about a quarter of the way up on the bottom of the right, we have a uh, an author, Paul Revere, the, the silversmith who would go on to a great deal of uh, fame and notoriety in England as you know one of the most vocal proponents of the Patriot cause. The fact that this is an illustration made by a, a you know, an ardent vocal supporter of independence and the Patriot cause, and that it is made with an audience of colonists in mind, turned out to be really significant. And it did not occur to me until much, much, much later than it should have that those details were really significant, that the way the British are depicted and the way the colonists are depicted have a lot to do with Paul Revere and what he's trying to accomplish. It didn't occur to me until way later than it should have that this event that we know as the Boston Massacre was probably not recorded as the Boston Massacre in, say, London newspapers. And that those details are linked very, very clearly to the author of the source, the moment in time that it goes out, and the intended audience. And you have to, you have to ask yourself who made it and when they made it and who they made it for, to have those details open up. It's relevant in any source you look at, but it's not always obvious how it might be relevant. So here we've got a political cartoon that ran in a, a newspaper in 1954 by an artist named Joe Kennedy. I don't know anything about Joe Kennedy. Um, I don't know much about this newspaper in Arkansas, except that its name is the Arkansas Democrat and it's published in Little Rock. I can notice that this is um, a cartoon about the civil rights movement and race relations in some, some sense. I can see some of those details here and I, I imagine that's what the cartoon is about. But I don't have all the information I'd like. Sourcing reminds me to ask these things and to try to, to determine a little bit more about uh, who this artist is and, and maybe where his political sympathies lay and what might be happening in that part of the world in 1954. And it reminds me that those things are going to be relevant in trying to make sense of this cartoon. In short, sourcing is just the observation that everything comes from somewhere. You know, primary sources do not fall uh, from the sky in their completed form. They are made either by a person or a group. They're made at a specific moment in history, and they're made with an audience in mind, and that all of those things matter. All right, so that's sourcing, the first historical thinking skill. The second one is close reading, and close reading is the most interesting, the most frustrating, most frustrating, the most rewarding uh, part of historical interpretation for me and historical analysis. And what close reading is, is the process of paying very careful attention, not to what is being said, but to how it's being said. You know, how does this source 
express ideas and how does it use things like language and tone, color, word choice to, to get across uh, its ideas. Close reading encourages you to kind of think about primary sources as the result of choices. Paul Revere could have depicted the events uh, at Boston Common in any number of ways, but he made specific choices to depict the colonists one way and to depict the redcoats one way and to title the image something. Uh, and that all of those choices are significant and that they might tell us something valuable about the past. And when we think about how something might have looked different, we get some great insights into why this document, like what, what secrets the particular document we're looking at might tell us. Uh, so I grabbed a, a great Library of Congress source that I love using with my students when we get to kind of late 19th, early 20th century history. Um, we don't have everything we'd like to know concerning sourcing. In this case, we know that it's uh, a political cartoon of some sort. It's entitled Concerning Race Suicide, and it comes from the humor magazine Puck. Uh, but beyond that, we don't we don't know that much from the document about who specifically made it or who they made it for. Um, the next thing I would do is to start looking at details. Uh, you know, what are the specific decisions that this artist made? And in this case, we've got a kind of two panel cartoon that's kind of divided on a loose diagonal from the upper right to the lower left. In both sides, we've got a lot of storks, a lot of stork imagery, the stork, you know, the bird that in you know, children's nursery rhymes delivers babies. Uh, and then we've got some really interesting choices happening on the, you know, the upper left, contrasted with the lower right. We've got in the upper left, some decisions about depicting people who seem to be really wealthy and really privileged uh, with an estate, and motor cars, and, and fancy clothes. And then we've got a stork there who seems to be kind of cooling his heels with a top hat and a monocle. Um, in the lower right-hand corner, we've got uh, a different slice of the, the socioeconomic pie. Um, it looks kind of like a late 19th century tenement. A lot of people crowded into small buildings and people playing in the streets and a lot of faces that um, seem to be welcoming a huge flock of storks that are dropping little uh, baby bundles on them. And I don't know exactly what any of this means, but the fact that we've got this interesting juxtaposition, we've got a flock of storks, but they're very, uh, they're doing something very different on the right-hand side as the one lone stork is in the upper left. And then this fascinating caption concerning race suicide uh, that gives me some new questions that I want to ask about you know what is the the message that this artist is trying to send and what is the nature of that kind of humor there's a lot of choices on display this could have looked really different and I want to uh, when I'm doing close reading I want to start asking those questions uh, you can apply close reading to any primary source. I mean, primary sources are all uh, products of choices, and that means you can apply this particular lens to them. So a great Library of Congress document, the Constitution of the United States, one of the crown jewels. We think of it as just kind of a thing, but it did not fall completed from the sky. We all, as history teachers, know that it's the process of, uh, you know, a long uh, and, and often contentious series of debates about what should go in and what should stay out. And because it's the result of choices and, and dialogue, we can think of this in terms of primary sources and, and close reading. I put this document on the screen in front of my students and they are off and running already. They all know exactly what the document is because you've done such a great job teaching them in high school. Half the students have their hands up. It's the three-fifths clause. And it stipulates that um, for Blacks held as slaves, they will be counted as three-fifths of a white person for purposes of uh, representation. And that's an accurate summary of the function of this clause. But when I'm close reading it, I'm trying to put it under the microscope and study not just what it says, which is the function it will have legislatively, but how it says it. And I notice, uh, and I point out to my students that what they all understand is the, as the 
primary function of the clause, which is to, to count Blacks who are enslaved as three-fifths of a person. The, the term slave, slavery, uh, Blacks, African-Americans, any of the, the variety of terms that were used um, to describe the people who are held in, in bondage, like none of that appears here, right? There's a very strange way that the framers tell readers to, to count this up. So they say, take everybody um, and then cut out the, the free white people, um, including indentured servants, uh, take out the indigenous people, the Indians who are not taxed, and then whoever you have left, uh, all other persons, count them as three-fifths. Well, functionally, that has exactly the purpose that we all know um, the three-fifths clause has, but that strikes me as an extraordinarily tortured way to express a pretty simple idea. And we know that the the framers understand the, the word slave and slavery, like there's a simpler way to say this. And yet the document as written goes to a much more complicated, much more difficult to follow way of expressing the same idea. That's a choice. And it gives us a you know an insight like, well, oh, there's something going on here that they did this much more difficult thing rather than the simpler thing. All close reading does is remind us that choices matter. And when we're close reading, we're paying attention not just to what is being said, but how it's being said. And sometimes to what's not being said for insights into you know, useful things about the author or the audience in this particular historical moment. Close reading is incredibly fun. It's exhilarating when it works. It's frustrating as you're kind of trying to pick that lock. When my students come into my office hours and they say, geez, I didn't know if I'm supposed to knock on the door because you're you're staring at your computer screen and you're staring at something in your lap and it's, you know, your brow's all clenched and you're grinding your teeth and you look really frustrated. This is what I'm doing. Um, I'm, I'm scrutinizing choices. And I'm, I'm looking at details and decisions and I'm trying to figure out uh, what they might mean. And it's exhilarating when you have a flash of insight. And it's frustrating because as I keep telling my students, primary sources do not come with a post-it note from the author that says, future history teachers, this is what I intended by this. We have to puzzle that out on our own, but it feels great when you have a breakthrough. All right, let's move to the third historical thinking skill, which is corroboration. Corroboration is simply a recognition that there are multiple primary sources dealing with uh, particular historical events, uh, and that each of them might have you know, different perspectives, different biases, that they might have a different angle on things. And just as you know, a detective or a police officer will interview multiple witnesses uh, you know, to a crime or a car accident and try to figure out what's happening. Historians want to get multiple perspectives and multiple witnesses to a historical event and get a better sense of how, uh, how things appeared to uh, participants and people who are contemporaneous to particular events. Our job as historians is different than a, say, a police officer or a lawyer who's trying to get at, you know, kind of a single story. As history teachers, we love nuance, right? We love complexity. We love when things are muddy and when not everything agrees. And so, you know, rather than try to flatten things and say, oh, this is the accurate source and everyone else is wrong, we're looking for information as to how the agreements and disagreements between different documents might tell us something useful. Let me give you an example from another one of the crown jewels in the Library of Congress. I love to use this with my students. It's the Declaration of Independence, but it's in draft. So this is Thomas Jefferson's uh, original hand. And then you can see uh, his editor, Ben Franklin, has gone in and um, touched up some of the language and some of the ideas. It's a great source to use with students, who, especially those who think that their writing doesn't need editing. Uh, the finished version, we all know the, the kind of soaring language that uh, Jefferson uses. It's become so incredibly famous that it's actually used as a model for other uh, charters of independence in the 20th century. And it's got those 
great lines in the preamble. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. They are endowed by the creator with certain inalienable rights. And among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. If some of the most aspirational language ever, ever penned in, in a government document in English. Um, and it's a great document to use. But it's obviously not the only thing uh, that Jefferson put out into the world and not the only thing that Jefferson put out into the world you know, in this decade. Uh, those of you who do a little colonial history know that this kind of primary source is not at all uncommon. Uh, what we have here is an ad for uh, a runaway person, uh, a man named Sandy that Thomas Jefferson claimed ownership of. Um, and this person had run away and Thomas Jefferson wanted to recover him um, and was so keen to get the man that he cons considered his property back that he offers uh, a reward. And that's really dissonant if you've just read the Declaration of Independence, which talks about inalienable rights and uh, the pursuit of happiness and life, uh, life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness and, and equality. Uh, and good historians seek out more documents so that we can get a more complete picture of the person. The point here is not to say, oh, Thomas Jefferson was a, a despicable hypocrite and we should throw out everything that we've, we've read by him. The point is to say, um, Thomas Jefferson is a person with very complex and, and internally inconsistent ideas about human liberty. And I want to know more about how Jefferson and maybe his contem white contemporaries made sense of these two things, the aspirational ideals they were putting out on one hand and the way they actually lived their lives uh, on the other hand. And corroboration brings these two sources together um, and gives us some new questions to ask about the world that these particular Virginians, uh, white and black, occupied in the 18th century. We can do this with almost any set of primary sources. Um, you know, just about every historical event generates you know scores, hundreds, sometimes thousands of documents, and they they don't all agree. They all have slightly different takes, and sometimes dramatically different takes. This was a great article that I found um, from August of 1963 it really stood out to me because we we just passed the um, 60th anniversary of Martin Luther King's uh, March on Washington. Uh, this ran in the Asbury Park Evening Express. And one of the things that made it stand out to me, uh, you know, I live in, in downtown DC. I was actually on the mall for the observation um, in this August, uh, is that the the journalist starts off by saying, um, I've been an, a newsman for the AP for 15 years, and part of my training is to be objective. But in this case, I cannot, because the thing that I saw that was so, the thing that I saw on the mall was so moving and so sublime that it it is impossible to be objective about this event. You know, the 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 profundity of it and the way in which King and other speakers called America to be more true to their ideals. He says it was a, a transformative moment. And it was really interesting to me to see a journalist kind of drop the the, the pretext, uh, you know, or the, the assumption of objectivity and say, I cannot be objective. That's how moving emotionally this was. If you just look at this document, you could say, oh, um, you know, white Americans, waited until Martin Luther King came along and then, you know, everyone understood that his message of equality and, and common humanity was, was overwhelming and persuasive. And so when King uh, finally asked nicely for these rights, white America turned around and understood the, the, the gravity and truism of what he was saying. Um, and yet that's not at all the case, even in newspaper uh, columns. So on the right uh, from just uh, four years later, this is a, an op-ed from the New York Times um, that ran in the spring of 1967. The New York Times is hardly an arch conservative paper. Um, and in this op-ed, the, the author says in the starkest terms, like King is making a mistake um, and he is muddying the waters. His, uh, his peace work on behalf of the, the movement against the Vietnam War is now muddying and confusing Americans about his work on racial justice 
and he is in error. And it's a, a part of a series of documents that is really critical of King um, and that are, are really instructive to read now in the 21st century when uh, I think, you know, kind of the image that we have of King is this, you know, widely beloved character that everyone understood as um, being on the right side. And that comes across, you know, the more stuff you look at, um, this is a, a great document that's still in process in the National Archives, but that was reprinted in the Times not too long ago. And it's an anonymous letter uh, that was sent to King uh, by the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The FBI had been wiretapping uh, King and listening in on his conversations and saw him as a, a huge danger to the status quo and writes him this letter, which is very different in tone from the op-ed that says, you know, King's March on Washington in 1963 was transformative and inspirational. Here, it's very critical. Um, and it, it describes King as a fraud. Um, and it urges him in the, uh, in the last few paragraphs to avoid his own humiliation by taking his own life, which is you know, really shocking here, is that the Federal Bureau of Investigation, an organ of the government, uh, is extorting uh, Martin Luther King and encouraging him to kill himself. Like we've got, you know, we've got three documents that give us a really complicated idea of what is going on, um, and particularly in the different kinds of responses to Dr. King's calls for uh, for racial justice, jobs, equality, uh, and the peace movement. Uh, and corroboration brings those sources together and puts them in conversation with one another. And rather than try to get a kind of one sentence description that, you know, white Americans welcome Dr. King's messages of common humanity, the actual reality is much more complicated. As historians, we embrace nuance, we run towards complexity rather than against it. Corroboration helps us do that. The last historical thinking skill is contextualization, which is the skill of reminding ourselves to ask what else is going on in the world when this document appeared and how much, how much those events have affected its creation. Um, and it's important to remember that these primary sources don't exist in a vacuum. This is one of my favorite primary sources. Um, I use it in almost every class I teach, particularly in the Civil War. Um, and I'll transcribe it here for you. My students can't read cursive, so I need to transcribe it for them. And here we've got you know, Abraham Lincoln in August of 1864 uh, writing and saying, this morning, as for some days uh, past, it seems exceedingly probable that this administration will not win re-election, which is really stunning to me. I mean, I, I knew a lot about the Civil War coming out of college, and I know that Lincoln is going to uh, win the 1864 presidential election. But now I want to know what is happening in late summer, early autumn of 1864? What is the context by which Lincoln writes um, with, with a great deal, uh, you know, he seems quite sure of himself that they're going to lose. And so now I, I've realized this is not uh, falling into the world in a vacuum. I need to know more about what Lincoln was seeing. Um, the sourcing here is not obvious. Uh, but if you flip it over, you can see the members of his cabinet. Lincoln writes this letter and then he folds it up and he asks his cabinet to sign it blind, which is a really interesting thing too. And now as a historian, I think I need to know what's happening in late August of 1864. You can do that with any source. The context is going to be important. This is a, a fun Bill Malden cartoon, uh, a kind of personal hero of mine, a World War II veteran and a great political cartoonist. It's from 1864. We've got a bowling ball that's knocked down the House, but seems to be having trouble with the Senate. The bowling ball's got a label on it. But absent the context, it, it's hard to make sense of the humor here. If we go back, we'll discover that this cartoon appears uh, after the, the 1964 civil rights legislation had passed the House, but it is now hung up in a 72-day filibuster in the Senate. And now I'm starting to notice that the Senate bowling pin looks a little bit like Strom Thurmond. Those nails... Um, and the kind of, uh, the way the bowling ball is drawn, give me some ideas about what is happening and why Malden has chosen to depict it this way. Context reminds us that events affect sources, sources affect events, and uh, those things work in concert. 
So those are the four historical thinking skills. We're going to keep practicing them uh, over the webinars and you'll have chances in the assignments to do that. But the best way to do it is just to kind of roll up your sleeves. And so we'll end my part of tonight's presentation with a quick quiz. So what we're going to do, we're going to do two of these. Um, and in each case, I'm going to do what's called a think aloud. So I'm going to pull up a source. I'm going to pretend that I'm seeing it for the first time. And I'm going to talk you through kind of my internal monologue. So what I'm thinking as I see it. And what I want you to do is you know, pay close attention and try to figure out which of the historical thinking skills I seem to be using most prominently. And you'll probably hear me do you know, a little bit of, of more than one of them because they're hard to disentangle, but I'm gonna try to lean on one of them in each source and you see if you can figure out which one. All right, so let's get started. Those are your options. I'm gonna put a new source up and I'm gonna do the think aloud. Okay. Um, this is pretty disturbing, so I don't know what I'm looking at, but I'm seeing a lot. I don't like that image, which is seems really kind of exaggerated and comically racist. The eyes and the buck teeth and the rise, uh, the 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 tail there. And then there's some really uh, concerning language here about uh, the outbreak of this epidemic, this pestilence, the task of extermination a complete cure, we need to uh, affect the origin of the, the plague by um, completely annihilating the breeding grounds. Oh um, man, some of these details are just kind of giving me the willies and there's something pretty disturbing going on in the way Japonicus, I mean, I guess this is the Japanese, are being depicted here. So I've got some questions that I wanna ask um, based on those observations. Okay, that was my think aloud. Um, you heard me talk through, um, you know, encountering the source for the first time. See if you can uh, figure out which of the, the historical thinking skills I was leaning the most heavily on. All right, poll is live. Go ahead and put your answers in. We want everyone to answer on the poll. If you are on a phone, you may not be able to have access to the poll depending on the version you're using. So we're sorry about that. Uh, we're going to give it about 10 more seconds. We want everybody to respond. And again, if you're wrong, you're wrong. I think sometimes when we work with students, we're very concerned with the teacher that we have to have the right answer. Yeah. And we learn oftentimes when we don't have the right answer. I think that's really important. This is a great exercise. Like I, I they don't, the sources don't come with a post-it note. So I'm trying to figure things out and I'm wrong a lot. Uh, but I'm trying to come up with better educated guesses each time I go back. And like I said, I'm trying to pick the lock. So maybe I've got some questions here. It's going to lead me to a different historical thinking skill and I can check my, my answers. All right. Let's go ahead and share the results. So of people in the room, 4% went for sourcing, 83% close reading, nobody chose corroboration and 14% contextualization. Okay, great. Um, I think you could have heard, you know, elements of, of sourcing and contextualization there, but the one that I was deliberately trying to hit the hardest um, was close reading. Uh, let's play again, kind of reset the board, and I'll show you a new source. Here's my think aloud. Whew. Okay. Um, who's this for? Fellow citizens. An abolitionist. Okay, we're, we're in 1837. Um, fellow citizens, there's an abolitionist who's come to town. Okay, a seditious lecture. Someone is exciting the feelings of North against South. Okay, so who's, I, I'm guessing the people writing this, they're angry about abolition. So it's Southerners, this is probably in the South. And they're trying to like warn that an abolitionist has come from the North. We're in 1837, so things are still kind of brewing. I've got an early guess. So I, I'm, I'm guessing this is somewhere in the South. And I know what it was, and I'm guessing it's for for other white Southerners who are um, trying to kind of rile them up. Uh, I do have some things I can check on. First of all, like Cannon Street and the Presbyterian Church, do some work there. Oh, okay. So it turns out that the Presbyterian Church on Cannon Street is actually in Lower Manhattan. Uh, in the shadow of the Williamsburg Bridge, which changes... Okay, so this is written by a Northerner, a New Yorker, and it's a handbill, so it seems like it's circulated to other New Yorkers, which means 
there's something I don't quite know going on here because they seem really upset about an abolitionist speech. And I thought that New York was filled with abolitionists. All right, that's my, my initial think aloud when I first got my hands on that source. Let's do the same game. All right, let's hear your answers. This is always an interesting question. The neat thing is we view some of these sources. Oh, it's some interesting results coming in. All right, about 72% of you have participated. Put your answer in, what's the best option? Sourcing, close reading, corroboration or contextualization? And you hear me do different, you know, use multiple skills even in the same think aloud when I'm trying to use one skill because they they work so so closely together I mean, you just it, it, that's naturally how historians think it's not a sort of cookbook one two three four but I, I was trying to lean on one in particular all right we've got an interesting results here so 62 percent went for sourcing none for close reading four percent corroboration but 34 percent contextualization okay. how do you split that up yeah, there's definitely some contextualization going on in there. The thing I was trying to do the most was to to talk about sourcing. So the the date and the creators, and I was trying to kind of figure that out from a uh, you know from a source that didn't say this is who we are and this is who you are. But there was definitely um, a ton of uh, contextualization going on in there too, as I was using some prior knowledge about what's happening in the late 1830s. You can't completely divide the sources or the historical thinking skills, but I was I was aiming more at uh, at sourcing. But great job, everybody. All right. So let's go ahead and transition for a second to talk about how we go from the thinking skills to what we're trying to do with the class. And really, at the end of the day, like Christopher said, is we want to give you the skills and the tools to go ahead and work with your students. And I think one of the things, I think I have a little bit of an advantage, and Elena has seen this too. We were both NHD students, a, at least for me, a very, very long time ago. And one of the things that I think is really important is to stop and think where our students are. So part of what we're doing with the sandbox activity is to go ahead and say, okay, let's stop and think about this research process. And let's be really honest about the process. If you're looking up and deciding, do I want to look at the Kansas-Nebraska Act or the Johnstown flood, you're probably going to do what most of us do, which is start with one of those tertiary sources, right? Look it up in an encyclopedia, look it up in a textbook, look it up on Wikipedia. Don't pretend I'm the only one who does that, right? Especially something we're less familiar with. We all do it. And a lot of our students do too. And I'm going to argue there's nothing bad or wrong about that because you've got to have the basic information. So it's kind of like Christopher said earlier, we've got to pump the brakes a little when we start with primary sources. I'm going to make the case we've got to pump the brakes before we can get to those primary sources. So what we're going to have you do in this module one assignment is pick your sandbox, right? So do a little research. Look at a couple tertiary sources. Look at a secondary source or two. Please don't misinterpret me. We're not asking you to do an entire History Day project in six months worth of research. I'm talking about 20 minutes of quick and dirty internet research. We all know how to do that. From there, that gives us the base, the solid basic information that lets us do the primary source work. And I'm kind of previewing a little bit of where we're going in with module two. But I think it's really important when we get to secondary sources, we don't just tell our students, okay, go find something. We have to talk about what are the positives and what are the negatives, because I think we have to not always research harder or longer, but research smarter. And one of the ways that I like to help students evaluate secondary sources, there's lots of different acronyms out there, this is just one that I happen to like, is the idea of the SOCA test. The first question, you know, S, is it suitable? Because you know what? You can find some really interesting sources, but if they're not really about your topic, sometimes you have to stop right there, right? It's not going to help you. Let it go. Secondary sources also should be objective, right? They're written after the fact. So a good secondary source is going to consider multiple perspectives or multiple points of view. If you're talking about why a law was passed, you should also have why opponents of the law didn't want it to be passed. For the first C, we say, is it credible? Secondary sources should be cited, right? There should be footnotes. There should be endnotes. There should be a bibliography. 
these things should be coming from recognizable, reasonable sources. We want to teach our students to look for citations. The second C is current. Is it reasonably current? An article from 2020 is a whole lot more current than an article from 1923. And it's not that an article from 1923 couldn't possibly be useful for research, but I would say this is, well, let's see what else has been written in that time period and has the interpretations changed or shifted as more sources or new interpretations became available. And finally, who is the person who's creating this and is that person an authority? Do they have a degree? Do they work for a recognized organization or university? Who's putting the information out there, especially in the information age? That question is really, really important. I would do the same thing when I get to primary sources. Talk with your students about the positives and negatives. But then I use something called the Rovar test. First, helping students option is the source reliable? Was it created in the time period that you're looking at? Or maybe was it created 100 or 200 years later? Did the person who created it have some knowledge of what was going on? Always origin. What's the origin of the source? Is this the original version? Has it been edited or redone? Is the source valid? Is it cited by other people? Are other people reading, uh, reading about this or talking about this in similar ways? A is accurate. Is it generally line up with the information? Does it say the event happened in the same time period? Or if there's a discrepancy, is there a way to understand that? And then finally, is it relevant? Primary sources can be really interesting rabbit holes. We'll talk about that more when we start talking about searching the Library of Congress in the next module. But you've got to make sure that it's going to be helpful to the project you're doing. So, okay, so what are we asking you to do? We're asking you to pick a sandbox. Ground yourself in some basic information, just like you do with your students. And the goal really is that this process can be a model for what you do with your students. Then your assignment that wraps up module one is to go into the sandbox packets, choose one primary source, not all of them, just one of them, and to really analyze it. A couple quick tips. First off, please go ahead and tell your facilitator which primary source you're analyzing. It will help them. Also, putting your name on your document, always helpful. The goal here is to work through these four steps, referencing this document and potentially other documents as it's important, especially in contextualization. Now, it's important, just like you're doing with your students, this has to be a reasonable task. You've got one page, and I'll give you front and back on that page, but one page to answer the questions. Please, bullet points are fine. There's no need to have multiple paragraphs in a box. Think five, six bullet points will do the trick. Also, please keep your font reasonable. Please don't make it a three-point font. I saw somebody do that one time. It's a little scary. But our goal then is you can show your students, hey, I had these you know, 12 sources. I chose one of them. And here's how I analyzed it. This is something then you can either use these materials with your students or maybe create a different sandbox based on the unit they're in. They can do those same things that you're doing. Remember Christopher said, it's like little league versus major league baseball. It's the same ideas. And if students see how we think through the sources, that's gonna help them think through their sources. All right. We always put rubrics out there. We want you to know how your assignment is being evaluated. So those are there and available for you. If you have any questions on them, please let us know. Now, so what's the deadline? You have between now and Friday, September 15th to complete. You have two choices on how to do that. You can either download it, type into your file, make sure you save it, and then upload a copy or because this is Google Classroom, everybody has their own copy of the document. So if you prefer to work directly in your copy, that's perfectly fine. It doesn't matter to us how you do it. The key is to hit the submit button when you're done. Once you hit the submit button, that flags your facilitator, hey, this person's done, they're ready to be evaluated and get some feedback. So you can turn it in tonight, you can turn it in up till noon on the 15th. From there, our facilities teachers will jump in, give comments, and give feedback. My strong suggestion, 
print that out or screen grab it. Show your students what you're learning and show your students how you receive feedback. So I think that's gonna help them in their research journeys. One other quick thing, I wanna mention the TPS network. Uh, this is a teacher's network created by the Library of Congress. It's got people from about 200 different organizations that post ideas and thoughts. It's totally free. Everybody can get a free login. If this is something you're interested in, I encourage you to please check it out. If you're looking for teacher ideas, it's a good place to go. Okay, it is exactly eight o'clock on the dot and we have finished the live portion of our program. So one really important thing before we jump to Q&A. First off, please grab your pen if you haven't done so already. So URL, tinyurl.com slash NHD dash HAWS, Historical Argumentation Webinar Series 24. This is your survey where you give us feedback on what we did tonight, feedback on what you've read to lead up to tonight. And once you do it, you'll get a copy emailed to you. I'll get a copy emailed to you, to me. And then I'll go ahead and reconcile those in order to give you your attendance credit. And again, it's full credit or no credit. You were here and you completed it or you didn't. All right, we're gonna pause at this point. I'm gonna go ahead and leave this screen up for a couple minutes. And this is where we shift to Q&A. And we'll stay for you know 30 minutes, 45 minutes if there's really good questions. This is your chance to ask questions about historical thinking skills, about historical research, about NHD research, and about applying this with students. We are more than happy to answer your questions. Just go ahead and drop them in the box. Elena will kind of organize them and vocalize them as she puts a couple together or spreads them out, or she'll also let you know if it's like, hey, this is more of an individual question. Um, we're not gonna take questions, obviously, but like, I'm not gonna talk about your individual grade. If you have a question on that, I'm happy to talk to you, but we're not gonna talk in front of all your peers. That being said, we wanna be respectful of your time. If you need to go, good night and thank you for coming. We understand that some of you need to get to dinner, to coaching, or to get your kids to bed. So but please take a minute, jot down that URL, knock out your survey, that gets you your credit. We'll leave that up, but I wanna see Elena if we've got some good questions. Yes, I have a few technical questions first. So bring them on. Um, do we need to cite in the chart the tertiary or secondary sources we consult to get information on our primary source? That's a good question. We don't have a citation method. I do think though, it's always helpful to add a simple hyperlink. That's gonna help your facilitator follow you, especially if maybe you've got, like there's a piece of information that doesn't quite gel right. If they can see where you're getting it from, that can help them give you better feedback. Um, but no, just make sure you let them know which primary source you're working with. Again, they have the same packets that you do. The second technical question, when you say one page, are we actually going to be typing on the template or in a Google Doc? It's a Google Doc, it's a template. The key here is we're not sticklers if you go over a line. But what we don't want, I had somebody do this one time, they turned in 10 pages with multiple paragraphs in each. That's not reasonable. We don't want you to do that. We want to be respectful of your time. And this is a work smarter, not harder kind of a thing. So yes, you have a Google Doc template that you can work in. If you prefer to download that as a Word document, if that works easier for you, go ahead. Okay. Um, two questions that kind of relate to each other. It's about doing this with uh, these skills with middle scores. So the first question is, is it legit to corroborate secondary sources in middle school? And then another question, would you teach the four steps to eighth graders in one lesson or break them up? I see close connections between them, especially as a former English teacher familiar with close reading. All right, Christopher, do you want me to take that one as a former middle school teacher? Or do you want to jump in on that one first? You are the expert on this one, Lauren. All right. I think with anything, you've got to gauge your students. I think if your students have some exposure, 
putting them together to, can make sense. However, if your students are new to this, I would start with them one at a time. So I would start with saying, okay, let's just look at sourcing today. Now today we're gonna take that same source and we're gonna add in the second skill. I think the more we can layer with our students and take them step by step through the process, especially with middle school learners, I think that helps and is easier for them. Especially when you can visually show, I, I always found it very helpful. When I taught middle school, I had like my main board in the front of the room and I had a sideboard and yeah, it was a chalkboard, that's how old I am. Um, but what I found is that when we were working on skills that would build from like Monday to Wednesday to Friday, if I could keep very simple visuals up and I could say, okay, on Monday we did this, now we're gonna add a layer. And maybe that layer was another piece of colored construction paper, something as simple as that. That would help give my student visual references. So they would say, okay, we're doing the blue part today. We're doing the green part tomorrow. Um, so I think that's absolutely something that I think you can do. And I think you gotta gauge where your kids are at. And I, I would say you look at the eye test, so when you're teaching something to middle schoolers and if they're engaged and with you, you're going to get their eyes. And if you start to lock, to lose them, their eyes are going to start to go everywhere, right? Because they're distracted. They don't know what's going on. They're paying more attention to the kids sitting in front of them. So I always look at the eye test. When the eyes start to go, it's time to stop, step back, review, and then pause before the next step. Christopher, what would you add to that, especially with the corroboration question? Yeah, I, I think you hit all of the, the critical things. Uh, it's been my experience um, teaching mostly college students and then sometimes high school students that it's it's a, a process of mastering this. And so I try to introduce them to the concept at the very beginning of the semester or the school year, but then I return to it consistently. Um, sometimes that's just like 15 seconds to put up a slide and say, hey, notice this conversation that we're having. We're doing close reading just to kind of remind them and name the thing that we're doing. Um, and then, you know, the the more you practice this and the more you just make explicit, like, hey, notice that that conversation we had, we were corroborating, remember that, um, that it will stick with more and more students over time. Mm -hmm. Okay, do you have tips for preparing students for dealing with translated documents? I find that sometimes students overcorrect and think of translations as secondary sources. Other times it's hard to get them to remember that translators played a key step in the process of getting the source to map. Oh, can I take this one? This is one of my favorite questions. It's one of the first questions I got asked when I came to History Day. Okay, so as Christopher's going to say, if you're going to do the pure historian work, You've got to have that second language, right? Because you've got to be reading those original documents in Arabic and Chinese and French and Mandarin in the original language. That's not realistic for the vast majority of our middle school and high school audience. Therefore, working with translated primary sources as primary sources is okay. Now, if you're writing your book and doing your PhD thesis, then the level and the standard is gonna go up, right? And that expectation is gonna be there. But I think it's really important to help our students see that while translations aren't always perfect, they give us access to those sources, particularly in world and in ancient history that are absolutely critical for us to use as a starting point and to help us analyze. Another tip I'll throw out, visual sources can be really helpful, especially when you're working with topics where there is a second language involved. So, all right, Christopher, what else, what else do you wanna to add to that one? Um, I'm just gonna underline what you said. I think it really is dependent on, you know, at, at, in middle school and high school and some undergraduate classes, it's, it's okay to use translated sources and you have to. And in fact, I think if we if we said you can't, we would be doing a terrible disservice to ourselves because we lose so much world history. Um, at at the you know professional level, Lynn was exactly right. You know, your your ticket to the carnival is being able to speak the language. And it's this is a time of year when I get a lot of students who want to apply to our PhD program and they're really excited because they have some really interesting topic they want to cover about, you know, 
the rise of fascism in Germany in the 30s. And I say, great, where did you learn German? And they say, oh, I don't speak German. Well, then you can't do that topic. It's just that simple. You know, that you, you have to, you buy your ticket by learning to use the sources in the original. Um, and so that's just a kind of a difference in, in the level. Uh, but I think Lynn was right on the money. Going back to what you were talking about, Lynn, with the Soka and the Rovar charts, are there anchor charts for those um, that they could, the teachers could use something with a little bit more elaboration on each of those? Actually, I don't have a specific anchor chart. If that's something that people think would be helpful, shoot me an email. That's something we could easily create. But in your guide to student research and historical argumentation, uh, in that book, in the, in chapter uh, three, which you'll be reading in the next unit, there's an explanation that gives a little more detail on that that can potentially help you. Like I said, I was kind of jumping you ahead a little bit, uh, but that's something to be useful. Shoot me an email. That's something we could easily probably create and throw into Google Classroom for others to use as well. A uh, question about the class. I think in the corroboration section, it asks, what are other possible sources? Are you looking for the actual name of the primary or secondary source that the teacher found independently? Or are you asking for general sources that would or could be explored? I love teacher questions. Honestly, either could be appropriate, right? You might be looking for news, more newspaper articles about topic X. You also might have found something specific in your packet or doing a little digging. I, I think one of the hard things about history is that it's not math and there's not always that two plus two equals four answer. But again, it's a thinking chart. We wanna see how you're thinking and what directions you might take this. Um, I think Kristen thinks that you answered this a little bit in one of your other responses. I'm gonna ask it anyway. I've been working on adding these skills into my class as a freshman. Do you have any recommendations on how to cycle through these skills in each unit? For example, I'm on the revolutions right now, next unit is the industrial revolution, and then imperialism. All right, I, I'm gonna be honest, I'm gonna use my coaching metaphor here. Um, no matter what level you coach, if you're playing basketball, the first thing they're gonna do is dribble and do basic layups, right? I coach softball for years. Every practice, no matter if you're working with fourth graders or you're working with 12th graders, once they stretch and run, we're throwing and catching. We're working at the fundamentals. And they do the same thing all the way up to professional leagues and Olympians. And so I'm going to make the case is that you've just got to hit it as much as you can and keep practicing it. I think um, we're using turning points as our theme for National History Day this year. That was one of the last ones I did in the classroom. And I would just, every chance I get, say, hmm, what were some of the turning points this week? And my students would usually groan and then turn to their neighbor because they knew that you know, the groan was the start of it. But then they'd turn and start to talk. And so I think it's just more about hitting it and repeating it and throwing in interesting sources that challenge. You know, Maybe some of the early sources are pretty clear, but then they get more complex or more confusing as you go along. So Christopher, what would you add to that? I'm, I, I don't know that I'm uh, an expert in this, but I certainly do what you do, Lynn, uh, with the with the acknowledgement that at this point, I, my presentations to my students, it's, you know, it's like a magician, right? Like I've stacked the deck. They think that they're drawing randomly, but I know exactly what's in there and what, in what order. And so Christian, like one of the things that I'm particularly cognizant of in the first you know, a few weeks um, is that if I have, you know, whatever I'm covering, if it's the Industrial Revolution or it's, um, you know, the era of good feelings or the progressive era or whatever, like I will pick a couple of sources that I know are excellent vehicles for one or more of the historical thinking skills. Um, and when I get to that source, I know that I'm going to not just be talking about content, but like, hey, this is a great chance for us to think about close reading because there's a neat detail buried in here or this is a great opportunity for us to return to the concept of sourcing because it's you can't understand why this person is saying what they're saying unless you think about who they're talking to um, and my students will be like oh wow that was so nifty that 
you kind of you know slid that into this conversation um, about the content and what they don't always appreciate is like I you know the deck was stacked right I knew they were going to draw the Queen of Hearts there and I was ready to talk about it um, and so I you know will will return as I'm moving through content to like this source this historical thinking skill um, for things that just really lend themselves to that. And I think too, the more you practice, the more automatic it can become, right? You, you get those prompt questions going and it's going to take in the beginning, especially when you're working with those younger learners, it's going to take more guided time as a teacher, but then you're going to be able to step back and say, okay, source this document. Here's your questions for reference that I've projected up on the board or have hanging on the bullet board if you need to remember them. And after a while, students are going to get it. And what I love about using this with students is they're going to start to ask some really good questions. And quite frankly, in my experience, students will come up with better questions than you can ever imagine. And when you get into that close reading, they're going to observe and see some details that you have never noticed, even if you use the document with hundreds of students over 10 years. Guaranteed happens to me all the time. Out. Lynn has seen me use a couple of these sources like that I could draw in my sleep. I've used them so much. And just last weekend, I was giving a, a public lecture and somebody raised their hand and said, what is that detail in the middle? And I said, what are you talking about? And they said, well, this thing here. And I said, I've never seen that before. I, and, and what was cool is I said, I don't know what that means, uh, but let's see if we can kind of figure it out together because that's what historians do, right? We We all know that historians are not people who just know a lot of things that they can tell you we've learned to think about the world in a particular way and and what kind of sharing with people what it looks like when we think through the world that way is great. It's just a great feeling. Just 10 more again. questions. Yeah, Excellent. If you have another question, we don't want to stifle you. Please go ahead and drop it in the box. But before you go, make sure to jot down the URL and respond to your survey so that you get your attendance credit for this evening. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> uh, a question from earlier that I just noticed I passed over. Is something, a primary source, written closer to the time of the event the most accurate? I'll take this one. Um, I think it's that's an intuitive way to think about the world, right? Like the, the closer you are in time, the more accurate it's going to be. Um, I think the, the historian's answer is sometimes or maybe. Uh, so for example, the Paul Revere engraving, you know, Revere makes that engraving days after the Boston massacre, uh, but is not a very accurate depiction of the events that transpired there between the Redcoats and the, um, the colonists. And in fact, there's like other primary sources that come out later. For example, there's a trial. Um, and if you're, uh, you know, interested in the revolution, you know, John Adams famously takes on the sort of thankless job of defending the Redcoats. And that gets multiple testimony from different participants. Um, other primary sources come forward and really complicate what we what we understand transpired in that exchange such that Paul Revere's in, engraving is, is not a good photorealistic depiction of what happened. Um, and some of the things that come out, you know, months or even a year or years later are much more accurate. And so the answer is like, sometimes it, it really depends on what you know about the source and who created it and what it's there for. Paul Revere is not trying to tell people what happened at the Boston Massacre. He's trying to get colonists who are sitting on the fence scared and and outraged and he's trying to make them respond in a particular way. And so there's no kind of hard and fast rule here. And as a historian, you you want to deal with every source and kind of say, what what, what is it I need to know about this? And, and using some of the tests that Lynn has uh, has laid out about how accurate is this likely to be? What what do we know about the sourcing? What are the choices here? Uh, it'd be it'd be nice if there was a simple rule like the closer it is to the the event, the more accurate it is. But there just isn't. It's complicated. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think too, scholarship changes, especially as new sources become available or become digitized or become transcribed or out in the public. History is not written the way it was 100 years ago or 200 years ago. And largely because our interpretations have shifted because the evidence has shifted. What's available today is different than what was available to researchers even 25 years ago. 
And so I think that that's shifting. And that's why, I mean, I think that's what keeps Barnes & Noble going, right? They keep getting new books uh, written because people are uncovering stories or maybe they're uncovering stories that were always there, but were never quite told or never quite analyzed in that way. But I think that's what makes history fun. It's never quite done. One last question, and I'm pretty sure it's about NHD projects. Um, what are helpful strategies for helping students narrow their topic? For instance, if students wanted to look at how the work of Martin Luther King affected the civil rights movement, what process should they use to narrow their topic? All right. First off, you are totally right. Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement is a gigantic topic. And I think one of the best ways to help students narrow it down is to not make them narrow it down right from the very beginning. I think it's helpful to have students do a little reading. So what part of King are you interested in? Are you interested in his theology? Are you interested in his work during the Montgomery bus boycott? Are you interested in the March on Washington? Are you interested in the sanitation workers strike? Or are you interested in his opposition to the Vietnam War? Well, until you've read a little bit of general information about King, you're not going to know enough to answer that question. So what I would always do with my students is I would have them do a little reading, maybe start with, you know, four or five or six different bigger topics and say, OK, start cutting them down. Which ones are you not interested in? Because, you know, picking a history day topic is like a Goldilocks thing. Can't be too big. Can't be too small. You can't do all of World War II. You can't do one moment of one battle in one place at one time. You got to find something in the middle. It's going to give you enough to write about but it's gotta be manageable enough for you to become an expert. And how big that topic is depends some on your, on your student, right? Topics I think are the ultimate differentiator. They allow students who need a little bit more complexity or challenge to pick a more challenging topic. They also can be simplified to meet the needs of certain students with special needs. Um, and I think that that's kind of the magic of the process but what I would say is shoot me an email. I've got a really good handout that's a topic funnel. I, honestly, quite frankly, a lot of our state coordinators have something similar. I think this is a worksheet that we've all stolen from each other and changed the headline and changed the color. But I'm happy to send you a copy. I found this is really helpful. And I know a lot of teachers swear by it to say, OK, take what you're the big picture that you're interested in and how can you narrow it down? So if you shoot me an email, I'll be happy to share that back with you. All right, anything else, Elena? Let's see. Um, I had three students who wanted to do JFK for their project last year, but they were not allowed to have the same topic. One student decided to change to MLK assassination, and the other two, one decided JFK assassination, and the other decided um, his presidency up to his death, which is how they got at the same topic in two different ways. So that was more just a comment. And Very then cool. we'll also mention too, because um, Elena and I answered these emails, uh, we will get emails from students this time of year. Will you tell my teacher that I can do X, Y, Z for my topic? The answer has been and always will be no. Your teacher sets the parameter for their classroom and it's up to them. And at the end of the day too, there's two people who approve a history day topic, right? It's a teacher and a parent or guardian that's it. Not us. No way. We can't do it. Um, but we do appreciate the humor in some of the emails that we will get an answer. But the answer will always be, no, we're sorry. <laughs> your teacher is in charge of your classroom. It looks like we are out of questions for the evening. So first off, thank you, thank you, thank you for those of you who stuck around to hear our Q&A please go ahead and just jot down the URL for the survey so that you can get your credit. I can only imagine what my email looks like with all these questions coming in, but that's okay. That's what we'll do in the morning. We'll clean up, we'll post, we'll share the links and have yourselves a wonderful day, a wonderful weekend. And we're looking forward to see those module one assignments next Friday. We'll see you next time.